We're on. We are. All right. <laughs> How you doing, Matt? I'm wonderful. Great. I'm wonderful. Great. Um, well, uh, we are uh, uh, taking uh, some of our final steps uh, before we complete uh, reading this book, and uh, I'm very excited to uh, to be at this point actually uh, with this book and and. Uh, it's been a project that I've had for, for uh, quite some time. And uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, opportunity to, to read this book in your company and to discuss its contents, uh, not just uh, its uh, historical information, you know, about 19th century, the rise of 19th century capitalism and, and so on, but uh, really I think is perhaps even more important is to discuss its relevance and pertinence uh, to our world today, and uh, uh, given uh, our fit in history, and given our place in society, given our racial designations, and uh, our attention to uh, these uh, fictitious, though very real and impacting designations, um, I, I'm you know glad to be thinking about this book uh, as it refers to as it might be used to make sense of the experiences of working class people in general, but uh, working Chicana and Chicano people uh, a little more specifically. Uh, anyway, um, so <laughs> chapter chapter 24, and uh, we've just, uh, you know, uh, we're preparing to discuss sections two, three, and four today, which are the middle uh, portions of, of this particular chapter. And um, anyway, I just uh, just to remind, you know, again, of course, the uh, title of the chapter is Conversion of Surplus Value into Capital. Uh, before we get started uh, discussing this uh, chapter, uh, Señor Mateo Cedillo, uh, is there anything that you'd like to uh, mention uh, related or not uh, to Marx and capital? Well, I mean, I think I think that uh, we're 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 entering to these chapters. It's almost like a book, right? Where it's uh, like a novel uh -huh. or something, where all the characters from the previous. Uh, that have been introduced throughout the novel are now are all fighting each other. <laughs> like all, all coming together, right? And, and, and for one last hurrah. So a lot of these concepts are covered in chapter 24 uh, yeah. and 25, actually. Um, the kind of remainder of the book are kind of like a synthesis, kind of a combination of a lot of things that we've already kind of covered. Um, yeah. And it kind of just like kind of remix of uh, some of this information. So we may end up trading over some information that we've mm. already talked about, but this, because that's that because the book does it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of it's it's interesting that way. I mean, it's such a huge book. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about it. It's just it, this this is the chapter where a lot of these these different threads are kind of they, they kind of return and yeah, it, and are um, yeah. Well, while the threads are returning uh, to use that metaphor, the threads are returning to construct uh, some kind of rope, I suppose. Um, anyway, this is the introduction. Uh, this is the introduction that I that I put together for us, and then what I'll do is uh, I'll ask you uh, uh, to comment uh, as I make as I arrive at uh, the end of a summary of a particular uh, section, and you know, of course, it's sections two, three, and four that we'll be discussing, and then uh, we'll see how we can. Uh, use this information to think about contemporary crises of accumulation uh, and draw our attention to what's taking place in the electrical grid uh, in Texas. Anyway, that's that's the plan. Let's see how close we get to it. Let's see if we give it its due attention in the time frame that we have, okay? Okay. All right, well, here we go. As this chapter, and, and for specifically section two of this chapter goes, uh, Marx is reviewing relevant political economy concerning the distinction between hoarding and recirculation of surplus value for the regeneration of capitalism. This discussion is reminiscent, as you know, as I was reading it, 
uh, and as you mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, Matt, this discussion is reminiscent of discussion of chapter three, where he accounts for the metamorphoses of commodities as use values into exchange value. In his discussion of the development of the money form on the basis of that exchange. <laughs> In this chapter and section, however, he distinguishes his work from classical economists who do not fit the identified metamorphoses within spatio-temporal contexts, what Marx calls the annual process of reproduction in a manner that reminds the reader of his critique of Aristotle, Marx asserts, it was extremely important for bourgeois economy, and I'll add its uh, ideologues, right, to promulgate the doctrine that accumulation of capital is the first duty of every citizen, that a man cannot accumulate without spending a good part in the acquisition of additional laborers who bring in more than they cost. Right. And to close this particular um, uh, section, uh, I'll say that he writes that the annual process of reproduction is easily understood so long as we keep in view merely the sum total of the year's production. But every single component of this product must be brought into the market as a commodity. And there the difficulty begins. A difficulty that Marx asserts is where Adam Smith ceases to investigate the greater complexities of the economy in history. Anything that you'd like to add to that, uh, Matt? <laughs> well, we know that he's, we know that Marx is distinguishing himself throughout the book from his predecessors, yeah. from political economists. And we know that uh, this distinction is rooted um, uh, in his attention uh, to the uh, relationship, not just between uh, the capitalist class and working classes, right? But really, is banking his, uh, to use uh, this term perhaps <laughs> a little liberal, liberally, uh, he's banking his uh, and rooting and basing and anchoring, I should say, his, his analysis of, of economic relationships, right, in a set of historical circumstances that predate uh, the mid 19th century and are in fact rooted in the kind of uh, disruption of, uh, social and political and economic relationships that existed in uh, 15th century and 16th century Europe, where the commons, uh, as he calls them, uh, land, uh, was available uh, to folks to farm. And uh, there was a direct relationship, uh, uh, an autonomous relationship with the land, if you will, right, that was disrupted. And I'm not saying that it was an idyllic utopian time, and I'm not even asserting that Marx said it was so, but certainly the, uh, the, uh, the forms of sustenance, uh, the economic uh, existence of people at that time, right, um, were, were displaced, uh, were colonized, and, and uh, were imposed upon uh, by a capitalist class and then their financial backers that sought to uh, extract uh, you know, uh, profits, labor, surplus value uh, from both uh, the displaced workers uh, and uh, the land uh, upon which uh, displaced workers uh, had depended for sustenance. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, then moving on to section three, surplus value is identified as revenue for the capitalist and simultaneously the basis of capitalist reproduction. Right, what he was talking about just a few moments ago. Um, of the capitalist, he writes, and I guess before we begin, uh, or rather before I begin this discussion of, of Marx's uh, review and critique of the capitalist, it's important to note uh, a couple things. Uh, as one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Matt, that this chapter, chapter 24, and then the last, or, or, or what otherwise would have been the last chapter, chapter 25, right, are are chapters uh, that begin to braid uh, different understandings, begin to braid different terms, 
and construct a rope or a chain or some, you know, um, some synthesizing uh, analysis and understanding of the economy. Uh, and it's a synthesis that Marx uh, was uh, promoting and sharing with working people uh, in 19th century, in 19th century Western societies, right? Mm -hmm. So it explains then his critique of uh, the villain, the vampire, uh, of the, the antagonist, if you will, of this particular book, which is, who is the capitalist? He writes, but so far as he is personified capital, it is not values in use and the enjoyment of them, but exchange value and its augmentation that spur him to action. Recall what he wrote, in chapter 15, the automaton as capital, and because it is capital, is endowed in the person of the capitalist. With intelligence and will, it is therefore animated by the longing to reduce to a minimum the resistance offered by the repellent yet elastic natural barrier, man. In fact, he repeats some of these very words here in chapter 24 in this particular section. So far, therefore, as his actions are a mere function of capital, endowed as capital is, endowed as capital is, in his person, with consciousness and a will, his own private consumption is robbery perpetuated on accumulation. These chapters, these chapters, right, in this penultimate section of the book were to be originally the chapters of the last part of the book. And as I understand, Engels compelled him to include the illustrative chapters of the last, what is now the last part, to both explain and describe, it describe uh, primitive accumulation. Thus, the language of this penultimate part of the book reads as a synthesis that it is to rally workers to action. Consider the critique of the capitalist. To accumulate is to conquer the world of social wealth, to increase the mass of human beings exploited by him, and thus to extend both in direct and indirect way of the capitalist. In fact, this convergence of capital and humanity and its Sisyphean pursuit for more, for the simple sake of more, requires driven attention and abstinence from pleasure lest avarice and desire to get rich cease to be the ruling passions. Thus Marx lays an analysis on classical economic studies and its ideologues of the capitalist class, much as he analyzed Aristotle's historicity, right? Of its distracted and perverted attention, he writes, and this I think is really important, this, this particular point uh, that I'm going to uh, identify at this point, I think is, is useful uh, for us to uh, build a discussion about uh, contemporary crises that have uh, their bases in economic arrangements, social and economic arra arrangements, you know, of the last century. In fact, social and economic arra arrangements that are rooted in the early part, pre-World War II uh, arrangements of the last century. Anyway, uh, getting back to this particular quote, Marx wrote, if to, classically, if to classical economy, the proletariat is but a machine for the production of surplus value, on the other hand, the capitalist is, in its eyes, only a machine for the conversion of this surplus value into additional capital, right? So that uh, not only is you know, as, as, as the capitalist objectifies the worker and as the capitalist uh, seeks to uh, extract surplus value from the worker, the capitalist, inattentive to himself and to his fit in history, uh, misrecognizes the fact that he is himself, or she is herself, right, a, um, an instrument of an in of, of an invisible force that 
uh, moves him or moves her to uh, to exploit both uh, land and people. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I'm. I'm. Uh... The thing is that you know, um, you know, we're talking about um, something you said earlier. You mentioned uh, that about the capitalist and and use value versus uh, the values is not in the uh, is not personified capital. It's not the values and use and the enjoyment of them, but in the exchange value and its augmentation that spur them into action. Right. So it is not creating cars. It is not. Um, it is not creating houses. It is not um, buying up land um, that thrills them so much yeah. as it is the money associated with it. So these 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 little digits on a um, on a screen that tells them how much money they have is what really compels them. Now that may or may not be true from individual capitalists, individual capitalists as to what is um, their flights of fancy and how they feel about themselves. Yeah. And, what they think and all this sort of thing, right? I mean, does the, the, the Steve Jobs really like making those items? Does Phil Knight really like making those shoes? I don't know. They seem pretty enthusiastic about it, but that's not really what's 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 propelling them as a social force in society. It's not their ability to make phones. It's not their ability to make shoes. It is their ability to turn that into money, right? And so, what what uh, you know, I remember hearing um, an old communist once say that, you know, GM doesn't make cars, you know, or, or, or no, it was GM, it was, uh, you know, yeah, G GM doesn't make cars, they make money, right, you know, so, but that, that kind of thing, you know, goes along with everything else in capital society, they don't, they don't make whatever they make, they, they make exchange value, they make the, they make the product, that, and that is the, the, the power by which they can, you know, command, command social forces, that is, that is the power by which they can, they can dictate, um, the, the general motion society because they can command um, labor because they yeah. can command, they can command um, you know the exchange of labor and production and 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 to market right because they are that they are, they sit the center point of that they have all this power in society and I think that's that that's what Marx was 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 describing there and so you know he's described throughout the book. And so here we find here we find him really kind of just pot shotting. I think uh, a lot of uh, you know Ricardo and Adam Smith and others, and you know in our time or in recent times, anyways, um, you know that figure would have been like Milton Friedman. Right? Yeah. So Milton Friedman produced a lot of these these videos in the eighties, and uh, maybe into into the nineties called uh, Free Free to Choose, and Free to Choose was like this kind of big libertarian kind of thing. Um, and and they were you know these videos that just basically explain like how sweatshops are good and you know how, how the world comes together to make a pencil and all these people would naturally hate each other but it is the but it's commerce it is it is good old fashioned capitalism that brings them together yeah. and and joins them in life and he and he really did take a pencil and said these people would all hate each other if they were know each other but it was through the indifferent da 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 da, da. he had his own little way of phrasing it. Well, what, 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 and you know, in our time, with where there's a flood of voices, right? Because you know, we live in the age of television. We live in the age, and this is before the internet, but you know, we live in an age of 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 of, of a mass form of communication that you did not have in previous times, right? So it's not necessarily, you know, in, in an earlier period, you know, communication was, was was more tightly held, right? It was more tightly controlled than, like, let's say, the time of Ricardo, and the time of Adam Smith, and the time of Karl Marx. In the time of, and certainly in the time of Aristotle, but we live in a time where there's much more information, right? So it's a lot easier to see that Milton Friedman is a charlatan, right, and still hold Aristotle up in like high regard. But Aristotle's no different than Milton Friedman. Aristotle's no, I mean, Milton Friedman is no different than Adam Smith. Is no different than than, than Ricardo. Um, what they're here to do is promote an idea um, that all is well, right? And so they are professionally, that is their job to promote the idea that all is well. So the Society is big. It's large. It's complex. Many things are happening. Happening. There is all kinds of cross traffic between those who have and those who do not. But at the end of the day, all is well. All is well, and all is as it should be. And this is what Plato put forward. This is what Aristotle put forward. This is what Adam Smith put forward. This is what David Ricardo put forward. This is what Milton Friedman put forward. Um, and you know, I'd say probably the the major successor to Milton Friedman is probably Jeffrey Sachs, right? Um, and Jeffrey Sachs um, says, no, all things can be improved, but generally speaking, things are well, right? So Jeffrey Sachs is seen as like this great um, uh, humanitarian, right? Um, 
and uh, he, he's he's seen as a, this great you know um, individual who's going to you know free Africa from poverty or something like this. I don't, I don't know exactly what he's doing these days, but you know this Harvard economist Jeffrey Sachs, and he's kind of like the celebrity uh, economist who works not necessarily Milton Friedman made himself a celebrity, which Jeffrey Sachs made himself a celebrity a little bit, but for the most part, he worked through celebrities, right? Yeah. So when you hear Bono talk about what he's going to do to save the world, that's really Jeffrey Sachs talking. When you hear Don Cheadle talk about what he's going to do to save the world, that's really Jeffrey Sachs talking. When you hear um, like Madonna and a few others talk about these things to heal the world, that is actually Jeffrey Sachs. Um, and he operates through um, a series of celebrities um, to, to really get a point what was crossed. Now, what is Jeffrey Sachs' track record? Well, Jeffrey Sachs' track record is that he got involved in Poland after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the fall of, um, of the Soviet bloc, and he basically robbed the country blind. Uh, he was involved in Bolivia uh, during a horrible uh, period of, uh, of uh, graft there, a series of graft there back in, I think, the 90s. Right? Oh. So this is what Jeffrey Sachs is. This is I mean, it, it wasn't recent. It was... It was, it was um, it was during, uh, you know, it, there wasn't, there was no ever morale, so there was no one to contend the forces. It was just like a particularly greedy, whatever. And he kind of get, he came in, did kind of this kind of like what now we should would later describe as shock doctrine, right? Well, that's who Jeffrey Sachs is, right? And yet Jeffrey Sachs is promoted by Bono, Oprah, several others, as as this guy who's um, out here doing good in the world, right? But again, he is this person that is like, all will be well, but we need to do this. All will be well, but this needs to happen. So Jeffrey Sachs did this in Poland. Um, he attempted to do it in Russia, but he was kind of thrown out. Um, this is after so fall so we uh fall so union and so this is kind of you know this is this is this is this is something that i'd like i'd like you to to uh address a little further did you say that uh uh, uh folks like jeffrey Sachs have a mouthpiece in in the form of oprah winfrey uh jeffrey Sachs definitely had, no jeffrey Sachs specifically has an uh, mouthpiece what's, in uh, oprah winfrey what's the uh, what's the significance uh, of that? Uh, generally, as far as um, racial minority people are concerned, what's the significance of something like that um, in a world uh, that purports to be colorblind? Uh, what's the significance of something like that uh, in a world that purports to be colorblind uh, and at the same time uh, injures uh, racial minority people? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's kind of almost impossible to answer the specific question of, of, of Jeffrey Sachs and how bad he is in, in Oprah's use of him. Mean, it's more really a question of Jeffrey Sachs and his general use of celebrities. But if you want to talk about Oprah, that's a whole other conversation. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 what Oprah has done, Oprah Winfrey is probably one of the, one of the most uh, terrible cultural figures mm -hmm. um, of the 20th century in terms of um, lulling people to sleep and accepting their exploitation. Oprah Winfrey is responsible not only for her own uh, career of blaming poor people for their own problems, uh, but also responsible for the careers of Susie Ormond, uh, Dr. Phil, yeah. um, and, and, and several other people who are, and what's her name, Iana, Fix My Life, some of this. So she's responsible for a number of people who come on television and tell you you're poor for a reason. You're poor because you fucked yeah. up. Um, and that is actually her message as well. I mean, there are several episodes of Oprah basically, basically blaming yeah. poor people for being poor. Uh, she's, she's a little more sympathetic than Dr. Phil, but um, in terms of just a uh, uh, battering ram of bourgeois propaganda that your problems are your own fault, yeah. Um, yeah. Oprah Winfrey is, um, is is very much a class war criminal. I mean, very, 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 you know, just a terrible, 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 um, terrible influence on society. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, well, and, 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 and she's and she and she's a harbinger of Dr. Phil, who may be the most like just the the the, the I mean I don't know one of the, one of the worst people, um, <laughs> you know, one of the worst people. Yeah. So, well, like, well, you know, like I mean, I I, I think, honestly think that like people talk about like the detriment to society and this and that the other. I think that the Oprah Winfrey is much worse for society than Jerry Springer. Um, like, you know, like Jerry Springer, it's actually, I mean, it's exploited and it's disgusting or, or Maury or something like that, but they, they're, they're like sympathetic. They're like, oh, you poor guy. I don't know. I, you know, Oprah Winfrey's very much like, no, no, no. So I remember watching this thing with Oprah Winfrey and she had, uh, it was, they, they, they brought on somebody and uh, it was with Maria Shriver and they had this person sitting in the middle of them and uh, she was supposed to be like a working yeah. class, you know, working class and struggling with her. And Oprah points at her and says, Maria, this is the face of the new poor. 
right? And she's pointing at this poor woman sitting between them, just pointing at her. She's like, yeah, that's nice. Like, I know, bro, poor people wear makeup. You never know they were poor, right? And so here you have Maria Shriver, who was like an heir to, you know, um, the Kennedy fortune. Oh, yeah. right? And here's Oprah, who, you know, was once extremely poor, probably much poorer than the woman that she's now pointing at, but is now a billionaire, um, um, sitting on stage and just putting this woman on display as uh, the face of the new poor. Right. And then these people in the audience, I guess they were all poor. I guess that was how they got in. Um, they start talking about their problems and how they're going to lose their mortgage and this. And essentially kind of hoping that Oprah will be like, you get a mortgage, you get a mortgage, you get a mortgage or something. Right. Um, which did not come. But they were like really like there was a clear like desperation in all their faces um, as they were telling Oprah their problems. And Oprah was like, wow, that's a shame. And I just wonder how future generations will look at this. How are future generations going to look? At, 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 at us at, at, at you know this time when people could sit um in front of a billionaire and heiress and like not try and like you know abduct them or something <laughs> 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 like, how will they look at that i mean like i don't know probably similar to how we look at like you know people like bowing to, to royalty or something like that and be like man what a bunch of suckers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, you know, I don't know. People still bow to royalty today. So what am I? Yeah, talking yeah, about? yeah. What, what is well, well, the thing is, world is full of suckers. I mean, everyone just sitting around, just, 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 just simping for the rich. Just, just, yeah. Simping, just, yeah. Um, it's terrible, and it's terrible. And and you ask about like racial minorities and this and that. I mean, I think that the the figures of racial minorities as the rich is a very, very good kind of propaganda symbol. It reminds me, you know, I, you know, during during the whole Trump. During the whole Trump uh, presidency, I, you know, in LA, every time they had like a rally for Trump, they always put like the black and brown people in the front, right? And they're like, look at this, right? And so it's like, this isn't racist. So like, I think in many ways that like, you know, um, the, the 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 capitalist, you know, general bourgeois society does something very similar, right? You're going to show me Oprah, you're going to show me Kanye, you're going to show me Kim Kardashian, and then have me debate for like years whether Armenians are white or not. You know, like you're going <laughs> to. <laughs> conversations yeah. as opposed to like why does this person have a billion dollars and i'm like you know eating like yeah. tuna cans instead of that question you're gonna have me like debating whether or not um armenians are white and you know if, if uh you know who's the victim here is it kim kardashian or is it kanye west right yeah. and you get me involved in these people's drama um you know as opposed to asking why is it that kanye west you know just crossed the billion dollar mark. How would that happen? Those those shoes are fucking ugly. How yeah. how that happen? Yeah. <laughs> and of course the question is stock evaluation. But I mean, like then you got like Kim Kardashian's little sister. I mean, but this is how this is this is what's wrong with people. This is what's wrong with people. You have Kim Kardashian's little sister, um, and she's selling her products. People want to buy those products and whatever, man. We live in a capitalist society, fine. But they actually had to go fund me because you know Kendall Jenner was only worth like uh, nine hundred and eighty million or something like that, and they had to go fund me. A, fun, a crowdfunding to get her over the billion dollar mark, right? So it was like really people were really invested in seeing that this. this I didn't know this. Yeah, they're really invested in seeing this person who had nine over nine hundred million dollars cross that billionaire threshold, and it was like really like something that they were super passionate about. So that's why I never buy into this whole like, oh, Gen Z is more revolutionary, or or any generation of people is more revolutionary than any, than any other. No, they're not. I mean, I'm not, and they're not less, and they're not less, and they're not more, and they're not whatever. Revolutionary self-select yeah. from each generation, and ninety-five percent of people don't know what the fuck's going on. Like, like the majority of people have no idea what's going on, and, and then you know maybe only twenty percent have some inkling of something that's going on. You know what I'm saying? And from that twenty, you can draw out you know the, the the forces necessary to change the world. This idea that you're going to reach everyone. I mean, my God, are you? I mean, people don't. Look, most people that are really actually socially conscious of things, that are really actually like, wow, they really unravel something, uh, dig down the rabbit hole, they usually met somebody at a pivotal point in their life that, that set them on a course yeah. to do this, right? So one, you got to be really smart. Two, you got to be somewhat cynical or, or kind of distrustful of things going on in you. And three, it's a total accident of fate that like you met someone somewhere at just the right time in just the right place and set you on a course of life, whatever. So people who are like really revolutionary, people who are willing to sit down here and do 50 weeks of reading Karl Marx are rare because they are the product of not only not only their self-selection, but also just fate, just also just, just dumb, ridiculous luck, right? Or, yeah. or dumb, ridiculous unluck. Who knows? Maybe life would be a lot better. 
<laughs> having done things differently, right? right? But but so, so so of course of course there are few few and far between, right? The people that are there, wherever. Um, and 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 the point is to grow those numbers. The point is to expand those numbers. Yeah. But this idea of fetishizing a generation of people, this idea of fetishizing people just because they find themselves in an economic and uh, some economic bracket, right? This idea of fetishizing people. Um, even on the basis of like race or gender, I mean, even even on those things, right? The thing like, okay, well, they will lead or they will lead, they will lead. No, it's going to be led by individual people um, who self-select and become collective into a group right. of people who are doing a thing. Uh-huh. You know, like everything in life, right? It will be group of people, people who uh, self-select into teams of people who make a coordinated effort in order to get something done. Yeah. It is not going to magically emerge from the pores of people who fit yeah. some type of demographic box. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It will be done by, you know, imagine like writing, okay, you know, this paper will be written by Gen Z's, uh, um, this, this paper on, you know, um, I don't know, on, uh, on hat making in, in, in Belgium. It's gonna be written by Gen Z's by them just sitting there and being so Gen Z. No, it's gonna happen because people sit down and write a paper. So yeah. similarly, like, you know, the struggles and things that are gonna happen in life are gonna happen because people sit down and do them. And this idea that we're gonna fetishize, this idea that we're gonna just say, oh, it's gonna just pour out of the pores of people. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I remember someone telling me, that uh, one time, I remember someone getting really uh, getting kind of heated with me. They told me you didn't need to read Marx, you didn't need to read all this communist stuff, you didn't need to do this. It's like we as people of color inherently have something coming out of us, right? This was years ago. This was during the Obama presidency, and also during the time when year this was was mayor of L.A. And I said something like, um, "Well, you know, Barack Obama's president, and and, and Villaraigosa is is the mayor, and I don't see them blah blah." blah. And this person, you know, what he said to me, he says to me, he's like, "Well, yeah, but you're picking the worst examples." Right, I'm like I'm picking the. These are the people in power. It's the mayor and the president. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, I'm not just like picking some random guy over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone else is doing great shit, but this one person over there is doing something bad. I'm like, I'm gonna pick on yeah. him, and he represents all of us. No, I'm saying like, no, this is that's the mayor and the president. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, and uh, and, and then they got mad. They just want they just want to stop talking. Right, they just, they want to cut the conversation short. So. Which is which is fine. I'm glad he cut the conversation short. That person is not going to be part of that team I was describing earlier. That person is going to go off, think silly thoughts, do silly things, and just yeah. be a silly man for the rest of his life. And I, I am. I, and the less time I have to deal with him, the better. Yeah. Well, there are these there are these fetishizations that keep us uh, from uh, understanding, uh, you know, the world that we live in. Uh, there are these fetish fetishizations. Uh, for folks who uh, are mayors of major cities and who, uh, uh, you know, who are identified as he looks like me, right? And it's on that basis then that we are driven to uh, follow their particular lead despite all the uh, ridiculous things and terrible and exploitative things that they do uh, to the people that they apparently uh, are like, right? Mm -hmm. And so not just of major cities, uh, but of course nations, a major nation. And then there are these celebrities. Uh, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, uh, understanding and making sense of how that happens, how our fetishization, uh, how we are duped into these fetishes that uh, keep us from understanding our own reality, keep us from mapping uh, the circumstances and the conditions of our lives that keep us from mapping uh, and I, and putting things on the map as they should be placed on the map, things that are right before our very eyes. You know, I, I remember a conversation uh, that I had uh, years, years ago uh, with somebody. This is before I really began to think about this kind of stuff. And I was asked uh, in this conversation, you know, why are there homeless people? And my gut level response at that moment was because they are on drugs. And then it occurred, like, what the hell was I thinking that I responded in the way that I did? Because there are other people that are on drugs and, you know, uh, shit, you know, I've talked about this uh, often. Um, uh, I forget the lead lead guitarist's name for the Rolling Stones. What's his name? Keith Richards. 
Keith Richards, you know, a man that is addicted to heroin and has blood transfusions, uh, he too uh, is a quote unquote uh, drug addict. And sure as hell, he's not homeless. So, you know, people are homeless because they live in a capital society and people are homeless because they are poor and they don't have, you know, they don't have the team that is required. They don't have the accidents of fate, right, that converge with their lives such that, you know, they have somewhere uh, to live. I'm reminded at this moment, uh, and I might be getting off track here just a little bit, but I'm reminded at this moment of a meme that Dust uh, James uh, put up uh, on Facebook, and, and I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was wonderful. I don't know if you caught it. Uh, he puts up a meme, a meme uh, that has uh, says, you know, capitalist, uh, what is it? Something about, you know, Anti, anti-homelessness in a capitalist society, and it's a park bench with rails in between the side rails to keep people from laying down on the yeah, damn yeah. park bench. You know? And then he has a subsequent, uh, you know, a juxtaposed image in that particular meme. It says, you know, anti-homelessness in a socialist society. And it's a high-rise uh, building of homes you know um it's as the saying goes it's the economy stupid it's the economy stupid that is keeping us from understanding it's the economy stupid and it's ideologues and it's celebrities that is keeping us from understanding the world around us yeah just you know the, the tokenization and, and, uh, and the and the whatever you want to call it of of um, of, of racialized minorities uh, in, in celebrity culture, uh, it, it's hard to isolate that from just the general the yeah. general celebrity culture. The general, um, you know, the society of spectacle where you're looking at things that are just like big and explosive and oh my god and blah blah. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it, but it's part. It's just part of the general superstructure. I mean, if you want to like isolate it, it's just part of the general superstructure of society. Um, um, and this is this is true. You know, in 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 most instances, I mean, like you know, the, this is the, the 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 culture that they beam out to us is one that's going to confirm the values of the general society. Most art we can buy, even shit we like, um, and even shit I like, just watching, like, oh, it's fun, right? It, it confirms the values of society, right? It will confirm the values of society. Now, you will like it for several other reasons, but at the end of the day, it will confirm the values of society. But this is true of olden times, too. I mean, you look at like something like uh, Robin Hood, right? And we have this idea about Robin Hood that Robin Hood is like, oh, man, that's like a, a fighting the power of some sort, right? Actually, if you look at Robin Hood, Robin Hood is fighting against uh, you know King John, uh, who's a bad king, right? And he's waiting for the return of Richard, the good <laughs> king. So this Crusades and blah blah blah, and Richard comes back, and all is restored, right? So the good king is restored to power, and that's good. So it's really Robin Hood is really the story of a bad king and how, like you know, somebody um, in absence of a good king rose up to confront the bad king. So then the good king comes in. I'm reminded yeah. of the this this transition of presidencies, but I don't know. I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. No, it's excellent. But like, but if you if you look at if you watch the more recent film with. Um, Russell Crowe, uh, there's an actual scene where it's really, it's really like laid out. He says that, you know, what lesson is, do we need to learn? And he says that, that the king needs his people just as the people need their king, right? So that there is an order that needs to be reestablished. This is a bad king and he needs to go. And we need a new king, a good king, and a good king who understands he needs his people just as much as they need him. But the truth is the people don't need the king. They don't need him at all. And we don't need the capitalists. You know, we don't need these people. You know, we need the capitalists in the same way we need leeches and ticks. We don't need them. These are bloodsuckers, right? And so, like, these are people who just live off of us, the rest of us. So we don't need them. We don't need them at all. And just as just as the serfs did not need the king. Um, but that, but the, but we th- we see things every day that confirm these values, you know. And I, you know, like, uh, you know, and uh, 
you know, and I think, you know, some of them, the worst elements of it are these things that like, you know, the, the, are like this is daytime television, Oprah kind of stuff. I mean, if you watch Hallmark movies, my God, they're horrible. These, these, these movies where, where you have like um, these Christmas movies are just terrible. They have, these, they have like this situation where you have like, you know, like this guy, he's got like a bunch of money. He's from the city, he represents a giant corporation and he's going to come in and he's going to wipe out the little, you know, the, 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 the hometown company. And then he's like, Oh no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that. Or it's, or it's a woman coming from the city. They, they, they switch roles every time, but like, they switch roles. He's actually usually the woman, the woman usually coming from the big city and she's returning home. And then she's like, okay, I'm not going to do the whole mega corporate takeover. I'm going to, you know, embrace the small business because they're scrappy and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But, um, that's 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 his homework movies and so it's essentially like you know like you don't have like in neither instances do you see the exploited worker of the the mid-sized business that runs the city or or actually a you know a large small business i guess a, a little petty fiefdom you know run by like you know like a, the, the local apple baron um versus you know versus the mega corporation right yeah. so you don't see the exploited workers of the mega corporation you don't see the exploited workers of the fiefdom you just see, you know, people embracing hometown values. So it's just, it's just, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a reproduction, rehashing, not at least as far as, you know, 19th century philosophy and, yeah. and uh, ideologies. It's a rehashing of Charles Dickinson's uh, narratives, right? Of uh, the wealthy coming to uh, save the day after all. Uh, Their ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, but you know, the, uh, the problem uh, for us today, and particularly as far as Chicana and Chicano people are concerned, other people as well, it's just that in this particular case, I'm talking about Chicanas and Chicanos. Uh, the problem for us is that we must contend with this notion of the so-called American dream that somehow sets the parameters uh, for us such that uh, these these other stories, these other narratives, these other these other understandings about how wealth and prosperity uh, are going to save the day in the end. Right. Right. So the, um, the big, the big, the big, work together. The biggest you know? money making enterprise uh, in my lifetime, in terms of film, uh, was the Avengers, uh, the MCU, mm -hmm. the, the Avengers. You know, the the, the Marvel. Where because if you look at just the total movies put together and all of them. So what are these movies, man? What are these? What are these? Well, the, the main thread, the two main people that we're following out throughout this entire thing, right, um, are, are a genetically modified American Superman, right, uh, in Captain America, and uh, and this guy who's like a kind of, a, 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 you know, yeah. an, a war profiteer, you know, like a, an Iron Man, right? So I, you know, I call it like Captain White America and Raytheon Man. You know, like those. This is a horrible message. This is a horrible, horrible message. Horribly, uh, horrible uh, confirmation of American exceptionalism. These two major figures. One is a, a you know, a war profiteer um, tied to the military, uh, a robber baron, uh, and Tony Stark. And then this other guy who's like this, you know, patriotic, um, blue-eyed, you know, you know, some, you know, some kind of Nazi shit. Uh, right. But he's fighting the Nazis, right, in, in, in Captain America. And, but these, these are, you know, it seems kind of silly to be talking about these things, but these are the things that, that batter our mind every day. These are things that, like, you know, and I'm an adult watching this, so imagine being a kid, and you're watching this, and you see, like, you know, Robert Downey Jr., like, you know, flying all over the place. He's Iron yeah. Man. Yeah. He's so cool. And, and, and that's that. So that these, these, these are things that they, they try to confirm to us, that this is good. This billionaire is good. This billionaire is going to. And, and how does the whole series end? With the billionaire, Tony Stark, making self-sacrifice, right? He's been, a, he's been like, kind of um he, he's like the prodigal billionaire, right? He comes back and he and he does the right thing, right? And that's we're on this kind of hero journey of Tony Stark from being very, very selfish and very, very into himself to, in the end, you know, like doing the right thing, right? But what is he? He's a, a war munitions billionaire. He is, you know, he is a war profiteer. And, um, you know, this is basically, he's basically Dick Cheney, you know, and, and <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a suit, in a, in a yeah. In a, and so this is this is what we end up this is what we end up uh, uh, celebrating in, in our culture, right? This is our Robin Hood. This is our version of that, um, and um, and it's hard to disconnect talking about racialized minorities and celebrity culture without just looking at celebrity culture as a whole 
and what these things confirm. So when you talk about specifically about like, okay, the fetishization, the bringing up of like, you know, the, 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 the racial minorities in order to like, you make it look like a, um, like we live in a multicultural society that's so great. Um, it, it's because of the conditions that we live under. We live in these horrible conditions. I was watching this thing on Netflix, um, the, 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 the Richard Ramirez killing, right? Uh-huh. And I remember seeing, just feeling just happy I'm, I'm watching a bunch of cops and I'm happy because I'm seeing a vision of Los Angeles that has a lot of Mexicans in it. And you don't really get a lot of that, even though yeah. the city is like 40%, you know, or 40% yeah. Rasa, right? But you don't actually get a vision of that from Hollywood, generally speaking. So just to see ourselves, on, just to see people on screen, right, that don't just necessarily look like me, but actually look like reality, right, was so different. And just to see that, um, made me happy for a second that I forgot that I was watching cops and a fucking psychomaniac, you know, like in a, in a, in a, in a fucking serial killer, right? So I forgot that I was watching, you know, people who are, you know, class right. traders and, you know, the bad for the capitalist class and the name, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the instance of the cops. And then I'm also watching this 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 guy who's like you know a, a murderer going around killing you know innocent women who likes to like watch the thrill. But I was just like happy like oh look it's a bunch of Mexicans <laughs> and that and that but that just shows you the position we've been reduced yeah. to that we're so we're so ignored we're so whatever that just to see ourselves um, just 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 you, you just like get a rush of endorphins um, and I think that that's, that's, that's true. And I, re- I remember that I remember. Uh, I remember observations like that, you know, during the Antonio Villarraigosa campaign, uh, people that um, were generally outside of, you know, participation uh, in politics, let alone uh, mainstream politics, uh, were coming out of the woodwork to support, you know, uh, this particular mayor, uh, you know, uh, and his and his relation, ultimately, uh, in fact, you know, his relationship with, with capital and as, uh, and as we understand, uh, capital from international capital that, that was making its way in the exploitation and segregation of the very community in which he was, um, uh, that, that he purported to be from, Boyle Heights, you know, and his, and his attack on uh, Roosevelt High School, uh, his partitioning and, and privatization, of the school, uh, schools in this particular community under a logic and an understanding, a narrative, right, that was promoted at the same time uh, by people like Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> you know, in her promotion of a movie at the time uh, called uh, Waiting for Who? Superman <laughs> to Come and Save the Day. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, the whole, uh, that whole, yeah, that, I didn't even know Oprah was involved in oh, that, yeah. but that whole, like, uh, <laughs> Char- charitization and shit. <laughs> yeah, she was she was promoting the movie on her show, and uh, I think I think uh, I think I you know I I was I was examining that show some time ago because uh, it was on YouTube. It was getting uh, reproduced on YouTube, and then mysteriously, it's 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 no longer there on YouTube. But uh, well, I first yeah, think that you know, like you know, like, those folks. I think pardon. That, uh, I think that that uh, you know, Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, Oscar Isaac, uh, Viola Davis, um, what else is in there? Jillian Hall, Viola Davis, uh, Oscar Isaac, Rosie Perez, and some of these names break my heart, and Ving Rhames all should have their SAG card stripped for like two years for having made that movie. Mm. <laughs> you know I mean? Like, you know, you're going to make a union busting movie, you should be kicked out of your union for, yeah, yeah. not forever. But for like oh, a, oh, no. for a period of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, ha. Huh. Uh, I like you know this kind of inattention, this kind of fetishization, this kind of ascription to a narrative of uh, the American dream that is inattentive to itself, uh, certainly inattentive to the role of uh, capitalist ideologues, and. Um, in promoting and maintaining the status quo and, and our fit within the status quo, that kind of inattention is the kind of inattention uh, that leads to the kind of crises uh, that we uh, see sputtering uh, today, spurring today, generating today, and it keeps us from understanding things in a historical fashion. In other words, 
as the planet warms, so does the Arctic. And as this happens, it, it disrupts the jet streams. Jet streams that, that had isolated freezing te temperatures in the Arctic. But as these jet streams are disrupted, as the Earth warms, these uh, you know, freezing temperatures descend upon regions that had never experienced you know, such, such freezing temperatures. Uh, and as I understand, regions that hadn't experienced these temperatures since the last ice age. That's, you know, uh, I'm not a geologist, I'm not an earth scientist, but uh, as far as what I've read, uh, as far as, you know, these things go, and somebody out there, please uh, confirm or, or contest what I'm saying. But the fact of the matter is, places like South Texas, South Texas, of all places, right, uh, are experiencing freezing temperatures, cold, very cold temperatures, and putting people's lives uh, at risk. It's laissez faire uh, economics of the 20, early 20th century, right, that pushed to generate capital and divert its attention, prevention, and response to such man made catastrophes if it isn't to generate more capital. Richard Parker of the New York Times engages in history to demonstrate that Texas strategies of federal deregulation and its government ties to oil industry is illustrative of the sort of analysis made by Marx 150 years ago or so. 80% of Texas power comes from planet warming technology. Uh, on February 17, Fifth, that's just four or five days ago. Fifty-six hours of black of blackouts had left about three mil, three million people without electricity. Now then, this is Texas. Who lives there? Who contends with broken pipes? Who contends with cold? Who contends with freezing battles between life and death? That this that this you know that this uh, natural catastrophe. Uh, creates it is poor people and it is people of color and in places like South Texas it's people like Mexican or Mexican people it's people like black people right that are um, living in a state that is whose logic whose understanding is a holdover and a reproduction of southern uh, racial and economic arrangements uh, you know, that that are rooted in vile and horrible uh, instances and practices of racism. You know, we were talking a few uh, a few shows ago about, you know, the onion strike uh, in South Texas. You know, this is uh, these kind of politics, these kind of economics, this kind of society is the one that, quote unquote, regulates the state and depends upon the exploitation of the land and its people. Um, what is the solution here? What is this, what, what, what's, what should be our response? Um, you know, Marxian, a Marxian reading of history and a Marxian reading of the contemporary conditions of people, not just in Texas, but people everywhere else that, that are impacted by, uh, uh, you know, oppressive capitalist exploitation right, is the dismantling of this very infrastructure. It's the dismantling of this very infrastructure and its replacement, um, uh, you know, by people who uh, are the authors and the architects of their own destiny. As you said a few moments ago, we don't need a king. And as I will assert, we don't need a Superman. You know, the solution is you know, in our hands and with one another. Well, you know, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. But I mean, for, for a lot of people who are looking at this Texas situation, and they're looking at all this deregulation and being like, what a bunch of idiots, and that's too good. Yeah. You know, like, I think you need to humble yourself a little bit because, you know, like, when you, when you, when you think about this as a Republican-type phenomenon, you have to remember that, you know, the state of California um, almost completely collapsed with its own deregulation uh, uh, 
debacle uh, when yeah. Enron yeah. Uh, came down, and the and the governor of the state at that time was was Gray Davis, and that was actually a lot of what spelled the end of Gray Davis was the Enron scandal, which ushered in Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, I mean, like, come on, man. you need to really, you really need to like you know clean your act up if you want to be so judgmental. I mean, it, there 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 really is a yeah. I mean, it, which is not which is not at all to say anything positive about Abbott or Ted Cruz or. Yeah. Or or, uh, or Rick Perry weighing in on these things. Um, it is it is simply to say that you know you really need to like look at the size and scope of of what the problem really is. It's much much larger um, than you know the 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 easy soundbite pot shotting whatever. I mean like again Enron happened in two thousand one. The governor at the time was Gray Davis. So like and this is like you know Gray Davis is coming in you know after Pete Wilson is kind of like this like you know this guy's gonna. This guy's gonna save the day. This is Joe Biden, right? He's gonna he was, exactly. You beat me too. He was yeah. our Joe Biden. <laughs> California's Joe Biden, and what do you do? You know, Enron, right? So like that 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 was um yeah, you know, that 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 kind of uh you know that happened. Uh and so what's going on? What, what what should be the national response? I mean, what, what should be the response to to the, the goings on in Texas this is a national response. Uh and a nationalization of uh, of, of of certain things and a, a national effort to fix these things i mean every time something horrible happens in this country people end up dying unnecessarily yeah. i always think of cuba i always think about cuba handles their hurricanes right so cuba is a small country um that you know has been hobbled um and you know, many of the resources are old and hanging on together by paper clips you know because because of the way you know this imperial embargo has been like a medieval siege on the country right so not only is that not only are the materials that they the, the the raw materials they're using to build their society not only are they outdated but they're actually old and falling apart as things that are old begin to fall apart right um and yet still they managed to 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 pull everyone out of uh, hurricane zones, um, and nobody uh, dies. Well, you know, and you compare that to Florida. They go to other islands to help people out of the same. Yeah, they go to other islands to help people out. They send they send doctors and nurses all over the world, right? So you have this 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 uh, this n tiny nation island that has been attacked and brutalized by you know the most powerful imperialist power that's ever existed on Earth, um, and yet they still manage to get doctors and nurses all over the world. Right, and not only do they manage to do that, they manage to take care of their own people. They manage to take care of their own uh, crises, and, and just relocate people using you know old buses, and you know like and, and, and they find a way, because you know where there's a will, there's a way. It's really not rocket science. It's pretty simple, yeah. you know. It's it's not rocket science. It's social organization. Um, and again, it's and what happens is because of the the ether of the of the of the beauty of the Cuban people is it because of the national feeling that stirs within the Cubans. Is it because the Cubans are magical? No, it is because teams of people get together and fucking yeah. do things, right? You know, so we here in the United States shouldn't fetishize the Cubans and whatever. And there's oh, they're just like they're just oh my god, they're just going around walking down the street singing Juan Tanamera and they're just like fucking and then that, that makes that just makes things kind of here that no. There are people who sit around and plot out, okay, this is gonna happen, therefore we must do this, and then they execute the plan. Right? And so too must we be. We must be like that. We must think about what is the problem and get teams of people together and execute plans, right? And society should be organized that way. And but society is not organized that way. Look at look at look look at the scandal with Ted Cruz, right? Everyone's mad that Ted Cruz left for, for, for Cancun. Well, here's a hot take. Who cares if he left for Cancun? If he stayed in Cancun, if he showed up with holding a bottle of water, who cares? People are still gonna die because it's capitalist fucking country. And that's the real scandal. You know what I mean? Like, fuck Ted Cruz. I mean, like, and it's funny that he's, he's getting mad, but think about what stupid children we are that we're like, okay, if we're gonna die, we at least want you to stay in the home state and deliver some water to some grandma somewhere and be in the newspaper doing that as opposed to going on vacation in Cancun with your family. Fuck you, Ted Cruz. That's fucked up. It is fucked up. But I mean, but, but the, the fact that you're focused on that and not focused on the fact that we don't have a national response the way the Cubans do, the fact that so many of us are just like, well, I'd rather die than live like a Cuban. Like, well, you know what? Maybe you should. You know, <laughs> All right, a, little, a, little, a little extreme. But like, <laughs> but, but like, but no, but I mean, like, you know, the, the fact that we have so many people in this country that are so committed um, to to this American exceptionalism, to this bloodthirsty, just like we're number one, and any any sign of compassion, even for myself, would would would, would, would could possibly. Hey Matt, you know, um, 
we're we're at the tail end, uh, and I've got to get ready for uh, my work. <laughs> work I get paid to do. Uh, students are uh, waiting for me to deliver stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, let's bring this to a close. Uh, let's, let's bring poetic closure uh, right. to this object yeah. to our observation. All right, they say freedom isn't free, but neither is a tank of gasoline. John McCain was tortured for someone's sins, but not mine. U.S. proletariat, self-taught Marxist, organic Chicano intellect, bound in contradiction, born in the belly of the beast, many things, but the wind beneath the wing of a war machine, never. And you spend your whole life throwing pebbles at a glass ceiling, only discover it was the bottom of a shark tank, but you knew that. And I didn't come to make friends. And I didn't come to hold hands. I came to talk shit. Raise the red flag. See who's still with me. George Clooney. Salma Hayek. Angelina Jolie. Don Cheadle. National Petroleum Radio. MSDNC. Brian Williams said the bombs were beautiful. The obliterator of nations. Hillary Clinton comes rushing from silence, demanding more bloodshed. Antonio. Julian Joaquin. What a blessing to see my reflection. All this murder and mayhem. Bono and Oprah. Trudeau and Obama. America Ferrer. Fareed Zakaria. All take up the neoliberal burden. The rainbow coalition of death. And I didn't come to make friends. I didn't come to hold hands. I came to talk shit. Raise the red flag. See you still with me. All right. All right. Chingon. Chingon. Okay.